We are live. I got a couple helpers. And there is one more helper, and I'll let you find the third helper that is here with me today. You can, I'm sure if you look around the camera, I, I honestly don't know where he is either, but I'm sure if you look around somewhere in the camera settings, you're going to find him. That's just the way he rolls. We just go up, oh, boom, I'm hiding him. And as, and as soon as I get up to do a demo, I'm sure, I'm sure that um, he's going to find himself a tunnel. If you guys have seen these lives before, then I bet you knew he was going to find a tunnel. All right, first off, where are you watching this from? Country, you don't have to get too specific, state would be good. Maine, hello, Sally. San Francisco, one of my fave. Oh, Sally, Sally is on it already. A reminder to like this stream, give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, and share to your social media because, yeah, you know we got you. You know we got you. Uh, Warsaw, Poland? Ottawa, Tahoe, nice. Ireland, wow. Ohio, oh, Germany, of course, Germany. World Team Trials this weekend. Betty's rooting for, for profits, relatives. Croatia. Mm -mm -mm. Mississauga. Kim, welcome. Neighbor. Practically neighbor. I have a question for you. I have a question for you all. Lack, if you struggle in the sport of dog agility, teaching, competing, your lack of success, or this could be a general question. You don't even have to be specific about you. The, the lack of success in dog agility is due to pick one. A, you don't do agility, so you, you don't have success. B, you don't have access to equipment. C, you don't have time. B, D, um, your dog, fill in the blank. E, I get lost on course. Or something else that you feel is the biggest um, limiter to your success. And I'm going to continue to look where you guys are all from. Wow, we have Iceland, Spain, England. Wow. Okay, we've got two A's. Don't do agility. Okay, do you have an interest in doing agility? Don't do agility, but that doesn't mean you won't in the, in the, in the future. Uh, I'm definitely doing tournament dog sports, but it's definitely a lack of, uh, of an own dog. Oh, you don't have your own dog. Hello from Norway. Wow. Hello from Norway. Cambridge, Ontario. Kathleen. Wow. That's like just up the road here. Oh my gosh. So exciting. Congratulations. What breed are you getting, Leslie? What do you feel is the lack of success? So, Tanya, this is a great answer. You have reduced, reduced confidence in your own dog. Okay. Hey, hello. I know where Annie's from. She's from Quebec City, but she's actually here a lot of the time. <laughs> Annie's one of our Handling 360 students. And who is also getting a new puppy. So exciting. Um, other. Lack of a success is introducing obstacles before teaching foundation. Yeah, that's such, oh my gosh. I, I think we're just gonna leave that one up here for a little while, Carla. Ding, 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 ding. American Eskimo Shepherd, oh, that would be so cute. Five month old Jack Russell, perfect time to get down on that foundation training. Don't have dogs focus on course distraction well same thing you guys are like twins twins um distractions at trials um okay so what do you feel is lack of success in dog agility either yours or generally speaking i only train hunting dogs so no agility for me henrik there are so many hunting breeds that do agility. Now, if you say my passion is dog agility or my passion is hunting and I don't have time for another sport, you do you and I'm giving you a high five because I just think it's great you're out there doing something with your dog. But 
don't believe that just because you have a hunting breed doesn't you can't uh, have a hunting breed who excels and thoroughly enjoys dog agility because there are so many out there. Um, Jose, that's a, a common answer I hear. I don't have a facility and oh, I have an overwhelmed dog. Oh, Chris, thank you. That's awesome. Um, five month old Jack Russell looking for an activity for her to enjoy. Let me tell you the activity for her to really enjoy. Retrieve, recall, focus for work. That's it. Retrieve, recall, focus for work. You can think about other things in the future, but you get your foundation down and you, there is no sport you can't do. Name a sport you can't do with a Jack Russell Terrier. Um, so Sarah says, my ability to differentiate between timing, all my two girls with queuing and one being softer than the other. Hey, that is a real um, challenge. My three agility dogs, so Momentum, who is my nine-year-old girl, who I haven't really brought her out to demo much today, so she came out. And my nine-month-old puppy, they're not too dissimilar in their level of drive. And, um, but then this sees my three-year-old, three-year-old, completely different dog. So I have to really step into the new handler with this E, be like really up and driven and intense with momentum and with Betty, I'm just kind of calm. So that's definitely. Um, okay, uh, seven month old Karen, to a female dealing with recall issues, stubborn. Are you stubborn, Julie? Cause I know for sure your dog isn't. And if you're stubborn, that's a really great quality because it means you will be relentless at learning. I love it. Um, that common issue, one of your dogs doesn't have drive, the other one has maybe a little bit too much. And I, I, I've said this many, many times, um, one of the big reasons that dogs get over the top in the sport of dog agility, and I believe this is true of any sport, like um, protection sports is another one I'll see this in, is um, lack of clarity. People believe they know it, and so they do things in the name of training um, as a consequence. And even if it's just a little saying, oops, try again, that is telling the dog, I'm judging you and you fail. And uh, over a long period of time that those dogs get uh, anxiety built up. And if they're a dog that tends to uh, stress high, then you're going to see that's what's gonna happen. So I believe I personally believe the number one reason for lack of success is a, a lack of or an erosion of confidence, both in the handler and in the dog. It can be one or the other, but quite often if it involves the handler, it also involves the dog. So if we can arrange our training so that our dogs constantly are getting confidence, if we can create an environment where you as a handler will constantly be giving confidence, then you will see success escalate. And we'll talk more about that today. Um, I'm going to start off by, first of all, let's give away a prize. So it, I see some of you have already shared. Boom, you're in. So we are going to uh, give away another of my favorite that my dogs are sleeping on, those little restore beds, a little restore bed. Thank you to the good people at, come on, where's your logo? I know there's a logo on here somewhere. There it is. Blue Nine, Blue Nine Pet Spa, a pet products. And um, yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I tell you every time I do a live, I love, love, love the, these beds, love them for the dogs. And I actually curl up on them. I need to, but I, if I'm at a trial, I'll, I'll actually go in either one of their big tent crates or I'll just find a spot uh, away from the action and I'll have a little nap, 20 minute nap on these things right here. Okay, so um, all you have to do is share this live and say, uh, you know, it's, it's not all about agility, but just say Susan's talking agility and success. And you can say anything you want really. Come on back here, say that you shared it. And if your idea is different, like if you shared it on Instagram, but you're answering in Facebook, you have to let, let the team know so that they can double check who shared. I don't think anybody would really 
say they shared and they didn't. Can we just have some thumbs up, some hearts for our, our sponsors? So Blue Nine, they've been fantastic. For My Merles, Galligan, and Run It Dog Agility. Uh, they've been awesome with our lives this week. Um, so Janice, I wish I could do agility, but I live in a condo and the facilities in Toronto are just too expensive. I had a student who for 20 years drove out here from Toronto uh, until she blew out her knees. And so um, where there's a will, there's a way. One of my dear friends from Sweden, this is a true story. One of my dear friends from Sweden, she, up until this year, for the vast majority of her agility career, she lives in the north of Sweden. Like, I think her next door neighbor is Santa Claus, which can't be possible because Santa Claus lives in Canada, but they're really close together. All right. She lives right at the top end of Sweden. And she would, on Tuesdays, pack up her dogs into the car, drive 15 hours down south to the city, do agility on Wednesday, and then drive home 15 hours on Thursday. Years and years and years did that until she is she went in with somebody and they're renting a building this year. So, you know, I feel very blessed, but for the first, I don't know, 15 or 20 years of my agility career, 15 for sure, um, I trained exactly where you guys train, wherever I could find a place. Most of it I did in my backyard or in the basement or in the living room. There's a lot of things you're going to see today, a lot of things that you can do in your own home. Okay, um, so I am going, I'm just checking out, making sure there's an anybody I'm missing. And I thought it was, Eric said, I thought it was crazy driving one hour one way. Yeah, I've had students that have come up from Buffalo every single week. Um, Annie, who I said hey to on here earlier, she comes from Quebec City, it's a nine hour drive. So it's where there's a will, there's a way. Are there people closer? For, for these people to go to, yes, but they've decided they want to train their dog in this specific way. And they're in uh, and, and the sport of dog agility. I think there's more kindness than in other sports, but the program that we do is just not as common um, in, in the, every walk of the world as more traditional lure is with, with dog training. Okay, and speaking of luring, there was a question that was posted. I saw it first thing this morning. It was, and I wanted to answer a lot of the, the questions this, this person had. Um, Michelle Casabon, she had a few questions because she was confused. And I wanted to, to, before we go too deep into the weeds with agility, talk about some of her excellent questions. So um, she says, she's confused because you say you don't use lures, but what are treats if they are not lures? I understand the concept of transfer value. Um, I'm not sure you do, Michelle. We'll get into that a little bit. But when does it stop being? for the treats. There are subtleties I'm not getting. Okay, I'll get to that question. I'm going to answer the rest. Also, what do your dogs do when you're not training? Are they free to roam or are they exhausted from training? So they just rest. Okay, my training generally happens in little bouts of maybe three minutes. So I'll train one dog for three minutes. They will hop it up. I'll train another dog for three minutes. They will hop it up. And I might be out here for an hour. And generally, I'll train three or four dogs, sometimes five. All right, it depends um, if Tater Salad's joining us, if Kim's bringing belief out. So in an hour, that's, and, and so, but there'll be times that I'll come out and I'll train for 20 minutes. I'll, uh, and I just rotate through two or three dogs, so they won't get as much work. So I want you to know my dogs don't get trained for hours and hours and hours every day, except they live with me. And so there are boundaries that they understand that have been taught through play, through games. Um, like when I'm teaching a live and I ask you to hop it up, I ideally hope you will hop it up. And I really should go back and reward the puppy because he's really new to this. He's not quite nine months old, just about though. I think this week he turns nine months old. Good kids, super good. I would give Swagger a cookie, but he really doesn't care about the food. Okay, I'm also trying a new mic today. So I'm hoping when I go out there to do demos that you'll be able to hear me. All right, so when I'm not training, are my dogs free to roam around the house? Absolutely. If I was in the house, I could walk you through and, and share with you. On the weekends, when Kim has belief at home, 
profit only goes into a crate at night when I go um, when I go to bed, unless I'm going out somewhere, and then I put them in an X pen. Other than that, all the dogs free to go wherever they want, whenever they want. I do not have a dog door. I do not have a fenced yard. And so I go out with them or at least stand on the porch if they have to go out and do their business. So that is it. Um, and they do get walked uh, two or three times a day. Usually a, it's about 20 or 30 minutes a walk. So yeah, they do get tired. Um, okay. Are you letting them play when they want or are they always playing with you when they want to play? I have no boundaries except with belief and profit because they get too crazy and too wild and I'm afraid profit's going to get hurt. So we let them play, supervised play, um, once or twice a day when she's here. And other than that, sometimes profit will play with momentum. Sometimes profit will play with tater salad. Um, and that's it. That's that. Yes. And LOH was here last week and told him and hit her, her border collie told him and profit played all together. Okay. Next part of the question. I'm, I'm wondering because my dog comes to me with a toy and we'll go outside. I'll go outside with her. So I'm wondering, do, should I go or should I train her not to ask? So reinforcement builds behavior. If my dog comes to me with a toy and the consequence antecedent a uh, behavior consequence. Think ABCs of training. I am working at my computer. That's the antecedent. The dog says, hey, she's working at her computer. That's when she wants me to bring her a toy so we can go outside. And she brings me a toy. I get up and I go outside. What will happen more often? I'll wait, leave it in the comments. What will happen in that, in that scenario? What a antecedent I'm working. Now, the antecedent can be you are sitting down to relax, you are sitting down to knit, you are sitting down to eat. <laughs> you will get many more toys. <laughs> you will get many more toys brought to you. And yes, reinforcement builds behavior. So the cue for the dog to wake up and spring into action is you trying to work or you trying to relax. If my dogs bring me a toy, then I just ignore it. I just ignore it because no, I don't want them to learn when I am working is the time they should be bothering me. When I'm working is the time I really want them to relax. Right? Yeah. You don't want them to learn that. A, the antecedent, we're going to talk a lot, a lot about that. The antecedent arrangements that produce the behavior. The behavior is I find a toy because mom is like a, a target now. And I find a toy, I bring it to, to mom. What is the consequence of that behavior? Now, if the dog is, uh, ideally, I've given them a job to do. If they bother me when I'm working because I've reinforced that because I've gotten up and played, then I would say, hey, can you bring that and go and hop it up in your bed? And then I might throw them cookies for hopping up in their bed. I might release them, but that doesn't mean I'm going to play with you. So I might have to do a little dog training to undo what I've done, create value for another behavior. When you see me at the computer, what should you be doing? Okay, now. We talked in the last live about a transfer of value. The transfer of value is a super important for something like agility. If I was to put a cookie in a bowl and I was to put it on the floor, would your dog look at it? I bet that they would, right? So what we want is we want to know uh, and why would they look at it? Because that is of value. And probably if we put an empty bowl on the ground, they would do that maybe once. But once they figured out it was empty, they, they no. I do things for food or my toy. Okay, so I want for the way that we teach handling, and there's many more people picking up on this now, but for me, I need to run in a straight line. I don't want my dog cutting me off. I don't my, want my dog bouncing, looking at me, barking, nipping at my arm. I want my dog looking at their line of travel, looking for the next obstacle. And there's a challenge when you go to a local class. Now, there's some, the very odd local class that you might have a really high level, successful, proven coach. Not, there are not that many of them out there. 
Most of the local classes will say, let's get on the, the teeter-totter. Let's get in the weave poles. Let's get on the big ramp your first week. We don't do that for months we, because agility isn't about going over the obstacles. Agility is about the path in between the obstacles. You teach a dog to have focus for running a path. Then we teach them how to do an obstacle, put the two of them together, boom. All right, back to um, value. So I'm going to change up my camera and I'm going to do a little demo with, um, okay. So I'll just do a little demo with profit. Okay, so I'll start with, um, I'll start with, with cookies. See, there's a few cookies in that bowl. And I'm just going to make this bigger so I can see what you see. All right. Now, Betty, come here. At my side? Good. So if I put this down, of course he's going to look at it. There's value in it, isn't there? Ciao. Good. Yay. I love that. That's so awesome. Okay, now I'm going to get a toy. Good boy. So I'll put a toy down. Close. Good. Look. Will he look at it? Of course he will. He loves his toy. Good. Good. Bring me. Nice. All right. Now, what if I put the cookie down? I'll go put cookies. Now, I could do the same with the toy. He loves his toy. But if I put cookies down, can I have that, you cookie? Mine. Close. So he's looking at he's looking at that, but I say I want you to look at this. Close. Sit. Sit. Good. Is he going to look over at that cookie? No, because I told him this is what's of value now. Right, get it. If I put him in front of this jump, would he say no, 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 no? The cookies are here. No, there's cookies here. I got to look at the cookies. Thank you. Mine. Side. Good. Look. Is he looking at those cookies? Heck no. Bloop, 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 bloop. Good boy. Okay. So these are really valuable. Good boy. Thank you. Mine. Have a tap. You can get up there with the shaking kook. Swagger, do you want a cookie? Do you want a cookie, Monk? No, he says, no, thank you. Okay, so does that, does that make sense that this, this is valuable? Okay, thank you, Sherry, for that. I'm glad the mic works. This is valuable, no doubt about it. The toy is very valuable. But we use the transfer of value and agility so that anything I point my dog at, it's, I say, this is where the value is now. So it could be the garbage can that's, I pointed him at. That's a value because if you're training at home, you might use a garbage can for agility training. What is it of value? And if, if, when they learn the handling of agility, they should be able to Go to what you say and, and come off it. For I'll give you an example. This toy, if I put the toy down in front of a jump and then put my dog on the other side of the jump, this could be considered a lure at that point. So let's do that one again. This is going to be difficult for the baby. Strike. Thank you. So I can you move? Come on. Yeah, I don't want you to distract him. Mine. Good. But close. Good boy. So if I put the toy right in line, I hope in the camera you can see that. It's right in direct line for that dog. I put him there. I tell him to, to look at his, his line. And I say, jump. Yay. You could say, oh, that's a lure. That dog would not do that unless that toy was there. Mine. But I think I said mine. Thank you. 
But if I put him, the toy is there now. Close. And I'm really set him up really badly. I've set him up just looking right at that toy. But I come out here. Where is he looking? Look, good. Jump. Good. Get it. Good boy. Okay. Or what if mine? That's testing. Did I have I transfer a value? Strike. That's testing. Is the dog doing agility just for what he's getting from from it? Okay. Mine. Close. So good. So good. Okay. So now let's get back here. Come here. Close. Close. I'm going to give him a little bit more room here. So I'm going to throw that toy out there again. And hopefully it's right in line with you and the camera and he can see that. But instead of telling him J-U-M-P, I'm going to give him another cue. Koi. Right, right. Good boy. Get it. Nice. So in that case, these are reinforcements. They are not lures. Fine. Okay, have a time. Super good boy. That was really a big boy demo. Those are big boy demos. So good, my boy. All right. So that's the difference between a lure and a reinforcement. The reinforcement, once you've trained um, the dog's basic fundamentals, focus for work, focus for food, focus for toys, focus for you. Once you've trained that, now you can use what that dog loves, food or toys, as a distraction to work, right? So I know that you want this, but can you do this? Uh, is there a reason you didn't condition your puppy to only target the ball? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you, if you could give me more information, like as opposed to targeting other toys, because I could put any toy down there, really. And he's not, he's not really targeting the ball. It's just a reinforcement. Like he targeted the garbage can. He tar targeted the jump. He, he's not taught to just target a ball. The ball is a distraction. And I can put any toy down there. And I, obviously, I, I, I would get the exact same results if I put nothing there. Okay, so I'll go back out one more time. You're being a really good boy. Now, let's take this Frisbee. Here, Moo, you can have, man, sorry, you have that fatty break. break. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter what I put there. Mine. And I'll put the, it doesn't matter where I put the Frisbee either. Side. Good. Luck. Right, 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 right. Bring me. Good. But if I didn't want him to get that, I could do this. Mine. Put that down there. Betty, side. Right, 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 right. Yay, bring me. So he wasn't targeting. He was given permission to go get. The value is with me. That's what agility handling is about. It's not about seeing something you want and diving on it. It's about the first time my shoulders told you you could were going towards the frisbee. The second time my shoulders said we're going away from it. That's what agility handling's about, my friend. You're so smart. That's a baby boy. Yes. Okay. Should I hop it up there? Good. Okay. So that that is what makes agility training so much easier for you all. That's how you do it. How do we get focus on those different things? In Handling 360, which is our handling course for agility, it's a year-long program where the very first thing we do is the basics, meaning not all dogs come in with the same level of in, uh, drive for work. Some of them, you get them out to work and they start sniffing the ground. Some of them, you get them out to work and they just go bonkers because they're so excited because there's dogs and there's people, well, in your bed, in your living room where you're training, there won't be. But so the basics is in Handling 360, it's called prep school, is where we bring everybody up to the same level. 
They'll take food when you ask. They'll take different foods when you ask. And if you've got a dog who's a little less focused and we get that drive to want to have focus for you, no matter where you're starting from. Now, if you have a dog who, as soon as the leash is off, they just want to go somewhere, we recommend you start in recallers. You don't start in handling 360 because it's super difficult to get a transfer of value from food or toys to you or an obstacle if the dog doesn't really want to work. So we need to get that first. All right. So then when we get that, we go to flat work. One of the first things we teach you in flat work is to tell is the, the dog to look at something. As soon as I, I mean, I was Fetty, I just added a, a verbal cue. I never did with any of my other dogs. I never had an, a verbal cue. But what it does for him, it tells him what I want. So I will, I will say lock, jump, lock, tunnel, lock, rye, rye. With my other dogs, they don't have that. But focus, that's, that's the next layer in Handling 360. Focus for whatever I put you in front. And can you see that as an advantage to all of your dog training, not just agility handling? There's so many people trying to teach. I don't care what sport it is. It could be hoopers. It could be um, search and rescue. It could be, the, you know, bitey sports. If the dog doesn't have focus for work, then you're constantly going to be in a battle. You're going to have a dog who wants to leave, wants to, wants to sniff, wants to chase. You, we've got to get that first. And that is an important layer in handling 360. Then we start adding the flat work. We teach them how valuable your body is. When I turn, you turn. Just because you're heading towards a jump, you've got to listen to my verbal cue. Now, this is a puppy. He's a border collie. He's very talented. I could probably teach him all the agility obstacles there are on the planet right now, but I don't. Because what is the number one reason people's lack of success? It's the lack of or the erosion of confidence in the dog or the handler. Now that confidence is eroded in the handler often because you are overfaced as a student. Somebody who didn't know better put you in a class and said, at the end of this class, you'll be able to run agility. No. What is the damn hurry? What is the hurry? Do things in a way that grows confidence. As long as you're loving what you're doing, do things in a way that grows your dog's confidence, which is why Handling 360 is so great because it teaches people in their home where they don't have to be distracted by dogs screaming because they love agility. We teach things in the home. And yeah, look at my puppy now right? This is what I want. On when we're on and then completely relaxed because they understand there's no re reason to get excited. We're not really doing anything right now. Okay. I hope, hope that makes sense. I'm going to go and check out. I know there was uh, some questions that I missed along the way. Um, Okay, I, I hope I answered the question about targeting the ball. He's not been taught to target a ball. He's been taught to look at what I ask him to look at. Um, next question. Whenever I send my dog for a search when shaping, she looks, she stares at me for a while before doing the thing I want her to do. Uh, so when you tell your dog search, doesn't she go and get the cookie? That's what she should be doing. And when she gets the cookie, she comes back to work. She should then um, go to where the value was last. That's what we're looking for. Um, oh, so the question about, is there a reason you didn't condition the puppy to only target the ball? Um, so that's a great question. I get it. So why did I let him bite the, the rope versus the ball? So there is a lot of times, especially in bite sports, where they teach the dog, you can only bite the ball. I think that's, that's a great idea. I didn't do it because I just decided I'd rather teach other things with my time. And I help that dog to understand that they stay away from my hands so I don't get bit. I think teaching a dog to target a ball is a great idea, but I just don't do it. There's just so many other things I want to teach. And, um, you know, maybe if I had um, 
a dog that had a propensity for biting my hands, I'd be more inclined to do that. Okay, I get that question now. Um, all right. For a new puppy, if you want, if you go through homeschool the dog and recolors, what should the criteria be for deciding when to start handling 360? It's highly unlikely you wouldn't be in a good spot to start handling 360 because if you've gone through those programs, you have all of the foundation skills that will help a dog learn to love to work with you. That's really what we need. And so then um, you start at prep school and you'll whiz through prep school. You'll be in flat work very, very quickly. So, um, and if you still are hesitant, Nancy, contact the team. And they will, they, they'll be able to give you, like, ask you questions to give you a really good answer. Um, podcast for Agility Verbals, or do I need a Agility 360? There's a lot of people that teach different uh, verbal, uh, verbal cues. Handling 360 teaches it in a way that really makes sense to the dog. Because it's not taught with luring. It's not taught with luring. That's a biggie. That's a biggie, okay? And thinking antecedents. If you have a, a skill, let's say we want to teach a dog to turn to the right, like I asked Prophet to, turn to the right. My body, if my body was, like if this was, if this was my dog and I wanted him to turn to, I guess that would be your left to to the right i want him to turn to the right say this is my this is me the handler i want the dog to turn to the right then um if my dog is on the outside of me turning to the right is always turning to me is easy turning away is more difficult and so we want those verbal cues right from the start so that the dog understands exactly what i want and then as we grow where most people just have vague cues and as the dog goes along, then they, they get more confused. Remember, number one reason you lack success is the dog's um, lack of confidence. And the lack of confidence comes, it gets eroded because of the dog being overfaced. Your expectations are far too big. Why do expectations get big? Because the antecedent arrangements that helped you create the cue to go over a jump or go in a tunnel likely involved some sort of lure, a plate with a cookie on it to go down a dog walk, a toy at the end of the dog walk, a toy to get the dog turned to turn. Maybe the dog can turn tight when the toy's there, but not when the toy's not there. All right. So we want to build in layers with understanding, not with props and lures. So flat work is a classroom in Handling 360, Martha, that you can do it all in your living room. You don't need um, the, I, I think, like using a garbage can, I put the garbage can somewhere, garbage can to teach some of the skills that we're going to need on jumps. It's, it's all done in the living room. Or if you've got a backyard, even better. But when you don't, like, you can do it anywhere you have a small space. And near the end of that, that classroom, we have, um, we suggest you have a jump. Um, Ellen, Ellen, if you are in recallers and you're ready, I would suggest you go to Handling 360, yes. So who is Handling 364? People brand new to agility, it's a great place to start because you don't have to undo things. We've had people who just won a gold medal at the Worlds, and then they sent me a, a letter, a, a, an email. Susan, I want to start my new puppy in Handling 360. Do you think that's crazy? Actually, I've had... Somebody who wrote, two other people who wrote me, they had just won at the nationals in the US. This one person that I'm talking about was from Europe. Won a gold medal at the Worlds. Should I start my, and I said, if you're a really experienced, successful agility competitor, the only reason you would, the only reason, or the only way it would become a great investment for you is if you would be willing to adopt a beginner's mindset. And I find a lot of competitors, their ego gets in the way of that. If you can come in with a beginner's mindset and let go of everything you previously were taught and learn from the ground up, you will be amazed. 
And this fellow did. And yes, his dog got on the, his new puppy got on the world team with before it was two years old. So you don't have to have aspirations for world team, but if you have aspirations to have success and agility and whatever that success is, when people say, I just want to have fun, isn't it, do you not think that Profit just had a, a lot of fun? Because of the clarity just keeps adding to that dog's, that puppy's confidence. And that's why I encourage everybody, no matter where you are, no matter how many sessions you've taken. And it is a big financial investment for a lot of people. It's in US funds. And so some of our students in Africa, it's like three months of their of their income to join H360. It's a it's a huge investment. But if you think about going to a local class or how many times have you been investing in different seminars? It actually is like the, the, the investment of maybe two or three seminars. How many times have you been doing it just to do the same thing and not move forward? You're still in the same place you were or incrementally better. You haven't, and, and the reason is because it hasn't done anything to, uh, to help your dog not feel so overwhelmed or overfaced, and it's not done anything to help build your confidence. So that's a biggie. Okay. Um, dog lost all her energy since being in heat a couple of weeks ago. I'm working to build up the value of my reinforcements again, but is this common? Eric, go to a health food store, and I am not a veterinarian. So maybe do some research on this. Let me share with you what I do with my females in season. A week or two before, during the season, and probably two months after, I give them a teaspoon, depending on the size of the dog, of raspberry leaf. You can buy it from the health food store, but do your research on that. I'm just sharing with you what I do. I am not a veterinarian. I am not a nutritionist, but I find that makes a massive difference. So there's an extra bonus. Uh, nothing to do about dog training. Um, backing up to the very beginning, when dealing with an anxious dog, how do you build that trust to begin for them to begin to learn? I'm having difficulty getting past the drama and fear to get to any training. Sheila, you find, uh, I wrote, um, I did a podcast last week all about the training den, and that becomes a conditioned, positive, uh, emotional response for the dog to go in there and do things. A dog like that, I would not take them to class. I would not put them in a, in a trial. Let's get them feeling good about being with you in doing some sort of work. All right. Um, our weaves two by two included in H360. Our two by twos are part of Agility Nation, which is a membership that has all of the other things other than handling. So things like how to teach a contact, how to teach a running contact, how to um, do really tough weave entries, how to teach weaves. So the other obstacles are in Agility Nation, which is a, you can buy it by a month, you can buy it by a year. And then Handling 360 is the fundamentals of everything to take your dog from being unfocused about work to all the way up to competing over jumps and tunnels, with jumps and tunnels. All right? That's the difference. One is about all the other obstacles. And the Agility Nation is like an a la carte. You go in and you say, I would like to learn how to do running contacts. It's there. I would like to create a fitness program for my dog. It's in, hand, it's, in, it's in Agility Nation. It's all, all of that, those things are in Agility Nation. I'd like just um, like a few skills that I can do in five minutes. They're in Agility Nation. Okay. Would you ever use search with a jump instead of a toy for rewarding? Um, if I had a dog that didn't like, or I, that, wasn't great on toys, I would put all my focus into helping create that dog's drive for toys. Meanwhile, I would use food. I don't know that I would use, I, I might use search. I, I, I would use a lot of different location specific reinforcement markers. Um, cook where they would, uh, um, they would drive to me to get their cookie if they're in motion and I would go to them if they're stationary. Chow. I would, I would use them, but, but honestly, I think all dogs can be taught to love to at least retrieve toys. And then you teach them to retrieve the toys with food in, and then you can give them food. That's probably the best thing. Drill, build drive and motivation for agility, agility nation or handling 360. 
Ellen, I believe the drive and motivation comes from the clarity and the confidence. And so uh, handling 360 is a week by week, lesson by lesson, layered. Agility Nation is you do this, and then you might jump over there and do this, and you might jump over there and do that. So definitely you will get the drive and motivation by teaching your dog the layers of handling 360. There is definitely some things in Agility Nation where I say, let's work on drive for weep holes or something like that. But once you go through H360, I think you're going to see it's going to be very different with the level of drive the dog has for the sport or for just working with you in general. Okay. <clears throat> um, with how popular protection bite sports are getting and how common balance training is, do you think the only way for reinforcement training will be to have them win worlds or something? Oh, I would like, I would like to think not. Like I started, there was reinforcement based dog training. The way I train in agility was not in agility before I started it. And <clears throat> it takes somebody who's in the bitey sport world to say, my value, my identity as a human is not attached to me being a world champion. When they can get to that point and say that, then they would be ready to try reinforcement-based dog training. Now, there's a lot of people in bite sports that are reinforcement-based dog trainers, but they're not at the top. I was at the top of my game in agility. I'd already won the um, US nationals when I said, I'm starting over and I'm doing things completely different and I'm not gonna use corrections in my agility training. And it was rough because nobody else was doing it back in the mid nineties. It was super rough. My dogs back then did not get the, the blessing of the clarity of training that my dogs today have. My students' dogs today do, do not get far better clarity than my students' dogs back in the mid 90s. But I was willing to, I, I said, if this doesn't work, I can always go back to what I did before. My identity as a human isn't tied to being a world champion. And that's, I believe, when it will happen for bite sports. That was a little off topic, but it was a great, great question. Teaching me to become a handler. Handling 360, Nikki, we have got you 100%. If you want to train two dogs at the same in the same session, how do you get one of your dogs to just hang out calmly and watch while you train the other? Well, you, you've seen I've train Fetty and Swagger or Minty stayed there. And if, and I'm sure I could train Minty and Fetty will stay there. So he's only nine months old. I always give him a little grace, but I would be shocked. Let me try that. Let me try that. Let me get up and I'll do something with Minty. I should have, I should have uh, thought a little harder about putting the heat on before I sat down here today because I am alone. Momentum. Straight. Good. Bloop, 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 bloop. Good. And, 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 and. Good. Um, so, one of the things that we, in, in, we want as a handler in agility is we want to be able to have our dogs do something while we run off and do something else. If you are like me and put a note in the comment, can you outrun your dog? Put a note in the comments. Yes, I can. No, I can't. I cannot outrun my dogs. Therefore, you're being so good so far. I need my dogs to be able to keep going when I send them to something. Okay, so I'm going to take this jump here. I'm going to move it up here so you guys can see what I'm going to do. All right. I'll get my garbage can out of my way. So this is a toy that she loves, but it's also going to be a distraction now. And 
Yes, yeah, get a sting. Okay, so I'm going to tell her to go around to the backside and take this jump, but I'm going to keep running, dragging her toy. So it's going to look like this. Sit. Good. So I'm dragging the toy. Ah, la, 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 la. So my toy is way past where she is. And she could see the toy going by. She had to make a decision. I should take that jump. Not only am I going by, but the toy's going by, and the puppy's still staying on the bed. Such a good man. All right? So that's why we need handling 360, is we need to be able to, OK, man, you can bring me the toy. You can stay up there. You were doing really good staying up there. It's her frizzer. Man, do you want the frizzer? Okay, out. You can get the frizzer and uh, hop it up with your brother. Good. All right. So, if you are like me and you cannot out outrun your dog, you need the ability to say, you go do that thing. I will be running up here to get ahead of you. That is the basis of what we do in Handling 360. It's called verbal override. My verbal cue tells her to do something, even though my body, and in this case, the toy dragging, told her, no, don't, don't do the jump. Just chase that toy. Chase that toy. OK, so that's what we're looking. Um, yes, OK? And if you can't outrun your dog, you need verbal override. Absolutely need verbal override. OK, I'm looking. And seeing if there's any more questions here. Um, so, so yeah. So how do we get the dogs calmly? We work on that. We treat, we teach value for that. Um, and so there's no reason for my dogs to get excited. I, uh, I think I did a podcast about this. It's hard to remember. Um, it's all about them understanding. I gotta. He had to. He had to uh, sneak off the table to get that toy. <laughs> so he's not perfect, and I'd find it entertaining. So it's all good. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna keep answering your questions. But if you would like to learn more about handling 360, go to shapebydog.com forward slash four years. Why? Because it's our four year anniversary and it ends tomorrow. Is rewarding a toy equivalent to luring? It, dep it depends, but not the way, there is nothing I just showed you that was luring. Nothing I just showed you in anything I've done today was luring. Me running by that jump with a toy was a distraction. If the, so what is the difference between a lure and a distraction? The lure is part of the antecedent arrangements that gets the dog to do the behavior. Antecedent arrangements, would my dog have taken the backside of that jump had the toy not been ahead of her? She actually would have taken it easier. I created a real challenge for her. So the lure, this this would have been a lure. I, what I what I, here? I'll show you. I'll bring the jump closer to show you what I did. Okay. So I told my dog to go to the back. I don't know if you can see me here. Uh, Da, na, 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 dancing. Okay. I told my dog to go to the back side of this jump. Meanwhile, I'm running around this side of the jump. So I told her to go there. Where would my dog, now Prophet doesn't know that. Come here, Fett. So, where would my dog naturally want to go if I just said, break? He would want to go towards the front of the jump. 
right? So thank you. Can you hop it up and let your, your sister come up? Hop it up. Pets, hop up, momentum break. So she, if I sat there, if, if I just said to her, break, she of course would want to take the front of the jump. My verbal cue, ah, la, 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 told her, go to the back of the jump. The toy dragging in front of her as she's trying to make that turn to go to the front of the jump doesn't lure her to take the jump. It actually does the opposite. It's screaming, you don't need to take the jump, just chase that toy. Um, okay, how old is too old to begin agility? It really depends on the dog. So um, the dog's health and the breed of the dog. I've had dogs that have won national championships when they were 10 years old, not in veterans in the regular class, they've won. I've also had my, my boy Swagger, who had won three national championships. Where did he go? Where are you, Monk? Can't see you back there. He'd won three national championships, won a gold medal at Worlds and a silver medal at the European Open. And he only was allowed to be in the sport for two and a half years because he had a little ticker problem. So it isn't about the age of the dog. It really is about the uh, soundness of the dog. Um, how do I contact your team to ask questions whether I should do Handling 360 now, even though I'm only halfway through recallers? We really need to do a lot more focus, but your program looks awesome. Okay, so just contact, send a note uh, to wag at dogsat.com, and somebody on my team will get back to you. I promise. Probably one of our coaches. Um, okay, any other questions? Okay, that's Lisa. I thought that was a question. Um, is it more motivational to send a dog to the dead toy after a sequence or to throw it when he completes it? If you, if you need the toy to create the motivation, then you haven't got a transfer of value. You need the 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 toy at the end should not be what's making that dog motivated. If, so if you need, will the dog drive just as hard without the toy? If the answer is no, then you need to pull back some layers, put in transfer value, do the things that give them the understanding of the words, give them clarity, decrease confusion. Then you're not gonna have a, if you have a dog that goes out in agility, they start sniffing or they go visiting the, the ring gate or they are, blithering and knocking bars and grabbing off courses into tunnels. That's just two different ways dogs show stress. So if you're saying, should we have, you know, which one would be better just for a placement of reinforcement? <laughs> Momentum. My nine-year-old little naughty, the nine-month-old is being better behaved than the nine-year-old. Did I not leave you on the, oh, maybe I didn't leave her on the bench. Okay, there could be that. So, I, in a perfect world, I would have somebody run with a toy. Definitely not throwing it because then the dog is, is going to be conditioned to look at you. So placement of reinforcement, but it shouldn't be about motivation. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. The motivation is the transfer value. I don't have that yet. Okay. Um, Recallers, if your dog isn't motivated to work, definitely, but it also could be handling 360, depending on what the foundation is. But it, when in doubt, always go to recallers. Okay, thank you guys. And I'm gonna put that, just check it out. Like tomorrow at midnight, our, our anniversary celebration closes and all of our programs are either going to be not available or they'll be available at least 30 percent more some of them are even more than that this is a great time to join us and you have the guarantee so join the program uh, decide if it's right for you from within the program but you get at least two weeks of coaching and community while you're in there okay thank you for all of your amazing questions 
And um, if you have any more questions, leave them on this live. If you're watching on YouTube, come on back, give us a thumbs up and, and watch it and leave me a comment after the live uh, is over when, when it's in the recording. Now, let's give away a restore bed. Thank you, Blue Nine. And it goes to Marion Schmenhauer Worman. I'm pretty sure you are not. Well, you could be from North America. Heck, we've got a great international community here. All right, Marion Schmenhauer Werman, congratulations. You're a winner. Thank you, guys. And remember, tomorrow at midnight, we close. So I'd love to see you in the program. If it's right fit, if you'd like to be coached by myself and our coaches, then join us. And if not, great success. Please take some of the things that I said today to heart. And when you're in a position that you can join our programs, I look forward to helping you out.